A mystery in God's Word is something that God is trying to let us know in a way that we can possibly comprehend it. And it is still a mystery because it is mysterious. And something that is mysterious is not easily known. But it is possible if you study it out and show yourself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Now, in Romans chapter 11, it states in verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, I've gone over this before, and the only reason why salvation has came, come to the Gentiles, is offered to the entire world rather than just God's chosen people as the original promise to Abraham that his seed should inherit the earth is because of their rejection of Jesus. And it was prophesied of that that would happen and that salvation would come unto the, unto the Gentiles as well. We'll cover over that a bit. Um, last time I went through the original parts on how the promise started and how we are grafted into that promise because of the fall of the Jews, us being Gentiles, the rest of the world. Now, in Romans chapter 11, we're going to touch on this real quick at the beginning of the preaching, and then I'm going to move into Acts, and we're going to do a rough uh, overlay of what happens in Acts, the transition that is taught in the book of Acts, where salvation starts coming to the Gentiles, and when it does. Now, in Romans 11, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled, speaking of the Jews, that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, as we read earlier in that mystery that's trying to be revealed, he starts out by saying this, and being led by the Holy Spirit, Paul writes to the Romans trying to let them know this mystery, and we are lucky to have it. Now, in verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. Remember that. Even in God's own words, he says that he sends him forth to be an apostle to the Gentiles in, in, in Acts. Now, he also states in verse, th verse 13, I magnify my office. He's bringing into focus exactly what it is that his job title is by God. Now, Paul continues, If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, the Jews, because Paul is originally a Jew, he saw, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Who's our root here? It's Jesus. It's Christ. It's God. If God is holy, then so are the branches that cling to him. Now, verse 17, And if some of them, the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, the Gentiles here, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root, and fatness of the olive tree, the original promise of God, the everlasting life here. Verse 18, boast not against the branches, not against the ones that were broken off, boast not against the, the Jews, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. We are to boast on Christ. We are to boast on God. Verse 19, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, 
because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. This is a reverent fear, a fear for what God has done to the Jews. How much more would he be likely to do that to the Gentiles if they were to reject him? They weren't part of the original promise. We are lucky enough to have the, uh, the, po the promise be offered to us, that salvation offered to us. Verse 21, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but to, toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. So the individual Jew can still be saved, but blindness in part has came to the, the Jewish nation, to the masses of the Jews. And you see that when you witness to a Jew, if you've ever tried. Now, verse 24, For if thou wert cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, being grafted into God, how much more shall these which be natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Now I read through all that. I hope you'll keep most of it in mind. As we're going to go through Acts, starting in Acts chapter 1. Welcome back to Grafted Branch Ministry. My name is Scotty Erb, and we're going to continue our study here on the Grafted Branch and outlining exactly what it means and how important it is for us to fully understand, as it is one of the mysteries in God's Word that He has revealed unto us in the New Testament. Now, please follow along in your King James Bible. And we're going to start in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Pause as needed, as I already have a bunch of different little bookmarks marking where I'm going in the Bible. And, well, keep up with me, please, and take many notes if you don't already know this. Now, in verse 4 of chapter 1 in Acts, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now in the same day, or just a few days after, during the day of the celebration of Pentecost, which is a Jewish holiday, it's not a Christian teaching, the Pentecostal church would like to believe, but um, it's, he's saying that, hey, I'm going to start baptizing you guys in the Holy Ghost. John truly baptized with water, but that but is very important in verse 5. Now flip ahead with me. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2. And those are Jesus' words, or God's words, right? Now, going ahead... Acts chapter 2, after the, during the day of Pentecost, they first speak in tongues, which is a sign unto the Jews, and you read that all the different languages in which they were speaking. It's not gibberish. No, it's an actual language. That's what tongues means. It's a language. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, let all of who? The house of Israel, the Jews, that God has made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. He's speaking of water here. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 
Verse 39, for the promise is unto you, the Jews, the original promise, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, who is he talking to there directly? He was talking to the Jews. Is a Gentile mentioned there? No. And yes, he's saying to receive the Holy Ghost, be baptized with water. But we'll find out that Gentiles were receiving the Holy Ghost without being baptized in water. Now, continuing on, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen just gets promoted within the inner circle of the apostles, and he starts preaching in Jerusalem. He starts witnessing to the people Jesus. And he's using each of the old apostles, or the, um, excuse me, the Old Testament prophets and the workers of God, starting with Abraham. And going on, and going through the story of Moses and everything. And then in verse 51, he, he, he kind of starts slamming into them. And he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ear, Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so ye, so do ye. Which the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them, which shown, which showed before the coming of the just one. Who's the just one? It's Jesus. He's sinless. He's just. He's perfect. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Verse 53, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. The what? The dispensation. Now, we're working through, through this transition period, there's a new dispensation given out to the world from God. It's the dispensation of grace. Grace through faith, believe, and receive Believe on the blood, the shed blood of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you receive the Holy Ghost. Now, continuing, verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They started chewing him out, biting their tongues, getting mad, getting angry, getting riled. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Only point in passage where God or Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. He's not sitting at the right hand of God, but he is standing. And then listen to what else it says in verse 56. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up. Jesus is ready to come down. He's standing up. The heavens are opened up. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And, witnessed, and witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now the tradition of laying someone's clothes down at their feet is saying that that death is on this guy. He gave the order. Here you go. You reap the plunder. Verse 59, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Pretty intense stuff, right? Now this was the last chance for the Jews to actually accept Jesus. And we're going to see in Acts chapter 8 how a Ethiopian eunuch, a non-Jew, is reading through scriptures and then is preached Jesus. And, well, let's just read and find out what, what happens. Okay, Acts chapter 8, verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him, the Ethiopian eunuch, traveling in a chariot. And heard him read the prophet Isaiah, it's Isaiah, and said 
Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. The place of scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. Jesus didn't resist going to the cross, but rather he went willingly, knowing what he was going to accomplish. We just touched on that this last Wednesday in the victory of the Lord Jesus, which is part seven of our Army of God series. Please watch those. Share them around. Now, in verse 33, In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generations for him? His life is taken from the earth. And this is in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. And the eunuch, verse 34, back in Acts chapter 8, verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet, this of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Now in verse 37, that verse is stricken out of all new, new versions of the Bible, new perversions. They take out certain verses trying to get rid of certain doctrine. And in verse 37, he says, and Philip said, If thou believeth with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you take that verse out and you read verse 36 to 38, it opens it up for child for infants being baptized, as they do in the in certain churches, a church centered out of Rome. But how can they believe? They're just an infant, but yet they're baptized and told that they're saved because of that baptism. It's not right. They need to, if thou believest with all thine heart. Now in verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. Read that sometimes without verse 37 in there, and you'll see how it slightly distorts the doctrine away from believing. And doing that, you ruin what is a, a profound part of this transition that I'm trying to lay out to you here that leads us into being grafted in. Now, in chapter 9, Saul becomes Paul. He gets saved. Chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatening and slaughter, against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest in Jerusalem, he's trying to get permission here, and desired of a letter to let, letter to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He's trying to capture all those believers in Jesus. He thinks he's doing God's work because he is a strong prophetic Jew. Now in verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He's trying to correct him. And he's letting them know, hey, if you're going to kick against the pricks, you're going to mess up and it's going to be painful, buddy. What is also interesting in this part of scripture, all the different pictures that you'll see of this part of scripture show Paul falling off of a horse. But where do you see a horse in this scripture? It's not there. Man is trying to distort scripture with images. <laughs> and we know that God doesn't like images. Now, in verse 6, And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? 
And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go to go into the city, and it shall be to told thee what thou must do. And when the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Paul is blind right now, or Saul at the moment. Verse 9, And he went, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and told him, said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the streets, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and has seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. He's trembling right now. He's like, is this really you, God, or am I being led into a trap? Verse 14, And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is, chosen, he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles. This is the same area of scripture where Paul, as we read in Acts chapter, or Romans chapter 11, how Paul magnified his office as the apostle of the Gentiles. And here God himself says, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16. So he's also going to go to the Jews, but the first mention is the Gentiles. Verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way. He ended up putting his hand on on Saul, saying, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way was thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive the sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell upon his eyes as it were it would have been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Now whew, Laid out a lot there to kind of emphasize where I'm getting here. Now in Acts chapter 10, next chapter we'll read verse 9 down to 16. And this is Peter. He's starting to see what God is working at. And he comes to remember at the end of Acts chapter 10 what it is God said, Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 5. Okay. Now, verse 9, chapter 10 of Acts. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened up, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Now, the common things, as the Jews would call them, the, the, like your pigs, your fish without scales, they weren't allowed to eat. And it would be defiling to their body because they were a chosen people to be peculiar to God. And Peter responds in verse 14, But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for if I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean, and the voice spake unto him, Again, the second time, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. 
This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now why Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of Simon's house, Simon being Peter, and stood before the gate. Read out the rest of this. Cornelius is a centurion. A centurion is like a high officer in the U.S. military, or most militaries around the world, would be a high-ranking officer. And the centurion was starting to believe. Being in the Roman army, he sent out to learn about Jesus. He's obviously a Gentile, and God was trying to prepare him for this. Now, all the way in verse 43, it dawns on Peter what God said back in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And he's preaching to the men of Cornelius and Cornelius himself here. And the Holy Ghost instantly falls on them, not being baptized with water prior to. Verse 45, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gifts of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. Then answered Peter, it's a confirmation to the Jews. The Jews need a sign, right? The Greeks seek after wisdom. And them speaking, probably in the Jewish tongue, not being trained, not really learning the Jewish tongue, would, I mean, that's like you trying to witness to someone that's from a different part of the world than you. And then instantly they start speaking clear English if you're from America or whatever language you do speak. They instantly adhere to it and start speaking it with you. Now, verse 47, And can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. And it carries on there, but they received the Holy Ghost without being baptized. And he said, hey, what's hindering them from being baptized? Let's keep up this tradition, right? And that's all it is. It's, it's a tradition. The reason for the baptism was to prepare the Jews to go before their king. It's a washing. It's a symbolic referencing of cleaning your outer self to represent your clean inner self, which is going to be before God. Now, in Acts chapter 11, verse 15 and 18, 15 through 18, okay, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Okay, now, this is all happening to Peter all over again. Same deal. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, here it comes, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they heard their peace, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then has God also to the Gentiles gathered repentance unto life. Now, this was just unheard of for a Jew, and Peter was just being astonished and remembering he's <laughs> repenting of his folly just in the previous chapter, how they got they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, but then he still dunked them in water. <laughs> now stick with me I know it's a little hard to hear if you're really big on baptism but baptism doesn't save believing 
once you're once the truth is preached to you and accepting it as truth. First Corinthians fifteen one through five, the gospel in which we are saved. There is no baptism there. I hope you understand that. Now, <clears throat> Acts chapter 15, and we'll start verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judah taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now these are those trying to keep up the, the law. And they're trying to in inquire the baptism that Jesus was teaching, right? And we'll skip down. Oh, let's see. Verse 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of Pharisees, which believed, saying that it, it, it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 6. And the apostles... And elders came together for the for to consider of this matter. They're trying to see, do we need to do this still? Verse 7, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Who was actually called to go to the Gentiles? It was Paul, or Saul, which became Paul. Peter, being a typical man, <laughs> he's the prototypical man in all scripture, messing up and then trying to correct himself or taking the credit of some other somebody else's work for himself. Now, verse 8, And God, which knoweth the heart, the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Now, it is true, Peter did preach unto the Gentiles. He wasn't called to preach unto the Gentiles, but God was trying to go to him first. Jesus was seeking him first to use him, to kind of open his eyes, to crack open the thought in all the apostles' heads. And possibly to use Peter in this instance, to reference this and to wake up everybody else. Okay. Okay. Bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of, God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. The grace through faith. Okay? Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience unto Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among them, among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon has declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now this goes all the way back to the promise that we read last in last video in Genesis. Now, this is another outlining of the grafted branch and what it is and how through acts the book of acts is given to us to let us know what the transition was from after jesus's death giving the jews chances and some of them were getting saved but the synagogues and the temple and the high priests they were rejecting jesus still and so jesus god to provoke them to jealousy turned his back on them and went to the Gentiles and offered salvation. He grafted them into the promise that was given to Abraham. I hope this message was a blessing. I hope it was uh, edifying. And please share it with those that you think it might help. And get, give it a like. Share it around. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. It will only help get the message out. You'll be helping this ministry in that way. Thank you for watching. Those that are saved, I salute you. Godspeed. And those that aren't, 
Again, go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It is the gospel in which we are saved today. Thank you for watching.